Hello, everyone. Let me first start with a question. How many of you have had a heartwarming, positive experience with the aroma of hot bread? Yeah, I knew it, right? It's not surprising. Hot bread tends to bring the best in us because it associates us with home, with sharing, with family. It seems to be an elusive truth, right? That it just makes us better people. And actually, French social psychologists went to organize an extensive research to discover how different fragrances affect our altruism. And out of all the different fragrances, like perfume and others that we think are very um, pleasant, bread tended to be the one that got people to really want to help strangers. It was researched in different locations, bakery, uh, clothing shop, etc. Now, bread is a very powerful sensorial trigger, but it really is a very powerful symbol. And it's a symbol of peace for people across the globe. One would wonder why, and I, as a cultural anthropologist, while doing my PhD at Princeton, started researching foods and arts for social change. And really, bread was the one that laid at the base of the three main Abrahamic religions, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And that's why it tends to always bring in us associations with peace of some sort. In Christianity, Christ himself said, I'm the bread of life. And I, as a practicing Orthodox Christian, can tell you how beautiful, how really inspiring it is when you go to church and you partake, all people in the community, all ages and ethnic backgrounds, of one cup full of wine and bread. And through collective prayer, we believe that it becomes the body and blood of Christ. So it's more than a symbol, it's really a deep experience. In Islam, I've seen how people take a piece of bread from the ground and kiss it and never throw it away. There's such a deep reverence for it, again, as a symbol of relationships and connection with God. And in Judaism, uh, I've lived with Jewish families, and on Saturday, actually on Friday night, they make the bread for Shabbat, which is the Saturday celebration, and it really holds the family together. So this is a very powerful experience, a symbol, a sensorial trigger. But even beyond home, there's a word we use so often, company, and it refers, it historically, since Roman times, has referred to a larger social network, social capital. So breaking bread with someone, cum panis, with fellow people with whom we share goals, values. And to return to my native Bulgaria, I discovered this wonderful old word that few people, I'm sure, do any Bulgarians in the audience know this word, omirlik? You don't, unfortunately, because it was a word that was used for bread 100 years ago, and it means literally peace builder. Isn't it beautiful? OK, so if bread is such a powerful symbol of peace, I ask myself a very important question. Can bread making be a peace building tool, an actual tool? So I asked myself this question in a very light bulb moment in the city of Bethlehem when I discovered it means house of bread. And I thought to myself, OK, that's an amazing name, but I'm sitting in front of a wall dividing the city, dividing families that are feuding, people that are feuding with each other, Arabs, Christians, Jews, Muslims. So is there a way that bread can bring these people together? I was sure there is, and that's the image I had in my head. I just pictured how people sit around the table, all these different religions, all kinds of people, and just simply make and break bread. And just a year later, this image actually became a reality. I tested it at my great-grandmother's house in Gabrovo, Bulgaria. It was just an old house we didn't use, so local volunteers helped me. And it actually grew, now it's seven, 10 years. This year we celebrate the 10th year anniversary. It grew into a global network. We call it the Bread Houses Network. And it connects people across the globe that are trained in these unique methods that I developed during the process. Methods that really bring people at a common level. Um, so at the community level, we work the issue of community building, but globally, I always had the vision, and I never gave it up, that I could really get global leaders to be better human beings and to, instead of making war, make bread. So at the United Nations Global Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 2012, I was actually the only Bulgarian and Bulgarian organization invited and together with local activists and social activists from around the globe, we organized this protest. So we went into the poorest favela in the city and decorated tanks with bread, and we were advocating to all of these presidents who had gotten there to lower the huge budget spent on war globally, it's billions and billions of dollars, by just 
0.01%, which, believe me, is a huge amount of money, and allocate that money to social programs and humanitarian aid. And I truly believe that if we had gotten those presidents to really make bread with us in the favela, with the people, and with us as social activists, we would have had better success. Because still it hasn't changed, you know, that 0.01%, we still haven't been able to get it. So instead of change makers, simply, I really think they can be alongside change bakers, change bakers presidents. And I'm saying it, and I still haven't given up on the idea to get Trump and Putin to make bread together. I'm working on it. And the former Bulgarian president, when he came to the bread house, he came by his own initiative. I hadn't even invited him specifically. He wanted to see what we do. And when he got there and made bread with people with disabilities, with Roma, with orphans, people for whom he said, I sign up on social policy documents, but I've never touched these people. And for him, it was changing. For him, it was deeply transformative. So one of my goals in life is to get <laughs> policymakers around the globe to actually make bread with the people that they create policies for and to really feel their hands, to really break bread with them. It makes all the difference in the world. Um, at the educational level, I truly believe if we get all universities around the world united towards peace building, we can achieve something big. I'm teaching here at AUBG in anthropology, and we already organized the community event with different local social organizations, and the students were amazed. It was the first time they had touched the hands of a person with disability. And we'll be able to do more and more. For example, with the refugee crisis around the world, we have to get universities to make bread with the refugees. How would these people otherwise get integrated in our societies if you don't see their faces and you don't know their names and you only hear about them negative things on the media? Well, I got the university in Ternovo, which is the National Military University of Bulgaria, to also get to regularly need bread with orphans and elderly people in the city. And it was amazing how the students at the university started discovering their vocation as peace builders, as peace building forces. That's what they wanted to do. They didn't want to wage war. <laughs> they wanted to build peace. And in the Sofia Bread House, we regularly have events with refugees precisely for this vision I told you. And we recently had an officer from the European Program on Immigration and Migration, and he said, that this really is an experience like nothing else he has seen in Europe. Because really, making bread with someone immediately makes you feel you're friends with this person. You just cannot seem to have anything against them anymore. You don't even have to talk. Uh, so we're hoping to scale this up and spread it to organizations working with refugees around Europe, because genuinely, this is the only way to really build friendships and to have what we call social integration. Um, there's one sentence, maybe one word with which I can describe all of this, and it is high touch, <laughs> not high tech, because we're way too littered with technologies that do not connect us. They fake connecting us. They disconnect us all the time. You have to be with the people physically, tangibly, and looking each other's eyes, not on the phone. <laughs> and this method actually proved to be a very deep kind of therapy. Uh, Patch Adams, the one who created humor therapy, gave me the push to test it as a therapy, and I started working with social uh, workers and art therapists, and now globally it is recognized as a therapy. We train a lot of people uh, who come from abroad to us to use these methods. When they Google bread and therapy, that's the first thing that comes up is our website, breadtherapy.net. And the, why, the reason why it's therapeutic, you're probably wondering, it's not simply because it's culinary, it's actually much more artistic. So we create bread puppets out of the dough. We bake them. We create whole performances with them on the table. The table becomes a stage, and we draw the props in flour. We also create songs, and we make the music for the songs with only kitchen utensils, so jars full of wheat seeds and uh, you know plastic balls. It's really creative, and that's why it gets people to open up. For example, with veteran women coming out of the war in Afghanistan in the United States with the University of Massachusetts, we created a program to help these women but that were with very severe mental disturbances share what they had been through, share their dreams, and the psychologists were amazed that for the first time they really opened up to speak. Otherwise, they were just closed in themselves because, again, it touches all the senses. It gets you to connect to home or to your hope of a future home. And all these people that we've trained and use these methods, we came up with this term, crambassadors, 
We call them crumbassadors because they really are ambassadors of peace. Crumb by crumb, at first people might be uh, saying, how does this really work? But once they experience it, everything changes. The network grew very big. It's more than 100 people on five continents now, and we call them bakers without borders, like doctors without borders, because these people really go in communities, and some of them travel extensively. Now there's two of them who are actually doing a round-the-world trip, and they make bread with all kinds of feuding communities around the globe. Uh, that's kind of the numbers we have now. Um, it's hard to calculate the beneficiaries because this more than 100 people and organizations have regular events, but at least 30,000, I would say more than 50,000 people have been engaged in all of these activities around the globe, and they happen every week. Um, and this, training these people was a big mission of mine, and I thought, okay, there must be an easier way to get them trained instead of them coming to Bulgaria, paying for tickets, um, all these costs. So I pretty much summarized the methods into a game. It's called the Bakers Without Borders Educational Game, which got the United Nations Award for Intercultural Innovations. And the game teaches not only the methods, but also the social business model behind. So it teaches entrepreneurial skills. And now I'll show you a little bit of the social enterprise model, because I truly believe that's the future. Social businesses will be on the rise. So what we do at the bread houses, we sell services. And with income from the services, we fund free programs. The services vary from team building, we call it bread building, and it's a very good service. People who come to us say it's the best they've had so far. To educational activities, we teach children values, so we diminish bullying at schools. Uh, their teachers get back to us and tell us, hey, this really works. Kids are not fighting anymore because we put the fighting kids making bread in the same bowl. Um, to career orientation for high school students and university students, to a very interesting event, Bread in the Dark, that's one of our newest creations, where you get blind facilitators with sighted people in 100% darkness. And it's so changing, it's so transformational, because you don't worry what you look like, you don't worry whether people are going to judge what you're going to say, you just need bread and you talk about life. So all the metaphors, flour, salt, sugar, yeast, you talk about what it means to you in your life, and people just open up. They feel like newborns when they come out of this event. And with these paid services, we found the free programs. And the free programs are ranging with all kinds of groups. There's not just one that we work with. The key to what we do is that we mix these groups, because otherwise, they would always stay locked and isolated in their communities. The people with disabilities would stay in their daycare centers, the orphans in the orphanage or in the foster home, the elderly people would always be in their hospice, the Roma would always be in their ghetto community, the refugees in their camp, and you would never see these people. And if you get them all together, it's amazing. You really have to experience it. And you just look around yourself and you say, hey, we're all human, you know, we're all made of the same dough. The human dome. <laughs> and one of the last, the most recent activities we have is called Solidarity Bread. It's every third Saturday of the month, so any of you can join. And homeless people started coming, making bread, which then is distributed on Sunday in the streets of Sofia to other homeless. And I think that's the key to social empowerment. If you really get the people in need, to help other people in need. It's not giving passively. You really have the peop to get the people engaged to do it themselves. And they share it has changed their whole experience, their whole perspective on life. Um, so this is the image of the social centers, bread houses, but we have another type of a bread house that we are also spreading as a social franchise model, and that's the bakery bread house. We opened the first one with my husband, with the money from our wedding. <laughs> we got about 7,000 lev from all the gifts. And we bought second-hand machines, and we tested it. We wanted to really open up such a bakery, which is very different from any other social bakery around the globe, because we do train and employ people from vulnerable groups, and we sell very healthy bread. But the key is that we also offer the free community events for the whole neighborhood to get together, for people to get to know each other, to cooperate, to solve social issues. And it really becomes a community center, a community hub. So it's two in one. Uh, it's called Nadeshko, or Hedgehog in English, we translate it as, um, you know, the, the hedgehog that teaches you not to prick others, to be kind, to be good. The Bulgarians would feel the play of words, but also in English, Hedgehog. And it gave birth to a series of children's books, 
I wrote for my daughters, but I mean, anyone, of course. <laughs> is it, more, many people are more and more interested in reading them, and they're about the travels of this hedgehog around the world who goes and solves some sort of social issue in each country through bread making. And I hope when I become a great grandmother one day, <laughs> I will be able to have written about 70 of these books, as many as the countries that I've been to. So I'll have something to leave to my grandchildren. <laughs> Um, and, and it always teaches virtues and uh, values to young generations. It's what I call cultural anthropology for children. So this model of the bakery got transferred to Latvia last year. It's the first time we really opened up a bakery like ours. It's called with a different name, the Creative Bread Lab, and it's run by an organization of people with disabilities, mental disabilities. Uh, so the franchise model is that we don't require them to use the same logo or the same name because Nadeshko doesn't really translate well in all languages. But if we've franchised the model, the methods, and the whole model of how it works. Um, but I want to conclude with my long-term vision that's actually beyond my lifespan. <laughs> and that vision is that in every neighborhood of the world, there would be a bread house, a community center of some sort where people would be making bread and making friendships. And that every soldier, along with his or her gun, or better instead of it, would have this. We call it the conflict resolution bread toolkit, but I like to jokingly say it's a piece in your pocket kit. <laughs> And what it is, uh, we designed it with a designer based at Pratt Institute in New York while I was at Princeton. It's in the shape of a heart, and it contains three smaller containers with flour, salt, and water. All you need to make bread. You don't need yeast because most flat breads in the Middle East and in Africa are made with just salt, but you need salt. And it's very symbolic of human relationships. Salt is like the difficulties that really help you appreciate the joyous moments. Salt really makes you thank for things. Just be thankful in life, right? It seems so easy when we say it, but we don't really do it. So what I imagine in my head is a soldier walking down a street, bomb street. He sits on a stone, and he takes this out of his pocket, and he starts mixing the ingredients, and curious children start coming one by one to him. They're not scared anymore, because he's not taking his gun out. He's taking this little piece of dough. The kids start playing, then one mom comes, then another mom comes, then a father comes, and the whole community gets the message. It's a message beyond words, right? You don't need language, because they don't speak each other's language, but they get the message. I'm here to make peace, not to make war. I'm here to make bread with you. It's really powerful, because honestly, ultimately, we really are made of the same dough, the human dough, and ultimately, ultimately, what we all need and need is love. Thank you.